A group of POWs huddles for warmth in a dense, wet jungle. They haven't eaten in days and are dying from disease and are still forced to work 12-hour shifts by their Japanese captors. As they try to get some rest before another grueling day begins, they hear the screams of one of their comrades. They close their eyes and pray that the soldiers don't come for them next. Every night someone is taken, and the smell of burnt flesh fills the air. The fire where the meat is cooked casts long dark shadows through the trees of the jungle as another human being is eaten by cannibals. War can turn men into monsters. Perhaps there's no better example of this than World War II. In Europe, the Nazis were murdering Jews and people who didn't fit into their ideology by the millions. In the Pacific Theater, countless war crimes were committed by both sides, and it was here that a gruesome secret would be uncovered after the war ended. Not only were POWs being mistreated and tortured, but in some cases they were being eaten by other humans. We're about to investigate several cases of cannibalism during World War II. You might want to prepare yourself to be shocked and appalled, because there are no happy endings to these stories. On September 2, 1944, a squadron of American torpedo bombers flew towards Chichijima Island, located south of the main island of Japan. Each aircraft carried a crew of three. As they approached the island, anti-aircraft guns let loose. Explosions filled the sky as shrapnel flew in every direction. A heroic pilot tried to evade the Japanese countermeasures, but the belly of his plane was struck by an enemy shell. There was a jolt through the aircraft as the engine began to fail. The pilot shouted back to the rest of the crew that they were going down. Before the plane went into a nosedive, the crew was able to drop their payload of four 500-pound bombs. Their mission was complete, and they now needed to evacuate the aircraft or they'd be killed on impact. The turquoise waters of the ocean could be seen on the horizon as the plane fell from the sky. There was no time to think. The crew strapped on their parachutes and jumped out of the aircraft while they were still over the island. The pilot kept the plane as level as possible so his crew had the best chance of making it out and deploying their chute safely. Once the last crew member was out, the pilot could bail. He was now over the ocean, but he had no other choice. In a split-second decision that would save his life, the pilot opened the cockpit and jumped. He landed in the waves of the ocean and engaged his life preserver. The plane continued gliding for a few more seconds, smoke streaming from its wings, and then crashed into the waters of the Pacific Ocean. The pilot looked to the sky and watched as his crew's parachutes descended toward the island of Shichijima and disappeared into its jungle. When the crew of the aircraft landed, they unclipped their parachutes and slowly made their way through the thick foliage. Unfortunately, the island was controlled by the Japanese and enemy soldiers quickly located them. They held the American soldiers at gunpoint and led them to their encampment. It was there that the POWs were tied up and held captive. As the sun rose the next day, the Japanese soldiers began to torture the Americans for information. The war in the Pacific had been raging for almost three years, and both sides were looking for any advantage they could get. Throughout the war, POWs had been mistreated by Allied and Axis powers in an attempt to uncover valuable info, but this Japanese regiment would take things to a whole new level. The American airmen were stabbed with bamboo spikes, waterboarded and beaten mercilessly. They didn't give up any information and refused to help the Japanese, which would cost them their lives. When the Japanese soldiers realized they would never get the information they wanted out of the Americans, they cut off their heads. The American soldiers' heroic actions would not become known until their remains were later found and their terrible fate discovered. It's unknown how much food the Japanese soldiers had on the island, but many claim that they were by no means starving, as there were plenty of resources available. This makes what happened next difficult to comprehend. When Allied forces took the island, the Japanese were forced to surrender. When the island was scouted and secured, the Allies found the remains of American soldiers that had been butchered and eaten. It was clear that the flesh had been cut from their bodies due to the knife marks on the bones. Japanese Admiral Kinisu Mori would later testify that their chef had pierced the livers of the American soldiers with bamboo sticks and cooked them with soy sauce and vegetables. It's been hypothesized by some that in certain Japanese belief systems, the liver is the part of the body where courage and power come from. By eating the liver of enemy soldiers, some Japanese military leaders believed that they would be given the power to defeat their adversaries. However, the liver was not the only part of the POWs that was eaten. Other Japanese soldiers stated that their commanding officer, Lt. Gen. Yoshio Tachibana, ordered them to consume the flesh of four American soldiers who had landed on the island. The most disturbing part of all was that this was not an isolated incident. It's not totally clear what the motives behind the cannibalism on Chichijima were. Some of the soldiers who ate the human flesh might have been starving, but several accounts do suggest that the Japanese officers planned this human sacrifice on the island. Either way, eight men who crashed on Chichijima were all killed, and at least four of them were consumed by Japanese soldiers. The day the plane went down over Shishijima, the pilot who bailed out just before the aircraft hit the ocean watched his crew land on the hostile island. 
When their parachutes disappeared into the jungle canopy, he began looking around for any form of rescue. There appeared to be nothing else around but waves and the debris from crashed aircraft as far as the eye could see. The current dragged him further and further out to sea. Suddenly something started to bubble from below. The ocean's waters began to swirl all around them. It was as if a giant creature were ascending from the depths to eat him. The pilot tried desperately to swim away just as the top of a submarine broke the water's surface. It was the USS Finback. The submarine had been dispatched to find survivors from planes that had crashed during the air raid. Filled with joy, the pilot began swimming toward the Finback. He was worried about his crew, but there was nothing he could do for them at the moment. As sailors aboard the submarine pulled the pilot into their vessel, they asked what his name was. George H.W. Bush, the man replied. Unknown to everyone on board, they just rescued the future 41st President of the United States of America. George Bush continued on with the crew of the USS Finback to rescue more downed airmen but the fate of the men aboard the plane wouldn't be known until years later. It wasn't until a researcher put all the pieces together and presented them to the former president in 2003 that Bush found out the gruesome fate he was saved from the day his plane crashed just off the island of Shishijima. This wasn't the only time that American soldiers would be tortured and eaten by the enemy. In another true horror story, two members of a downed B-29 bomber were captured and brought to a medical facility where they would undergo medical experiments. One medical student who was stationed at the facility recounted later that the men were brought into the lab blindfolded. They had been injured when the bomber crashed and were led to believe that they were at the hospital to have their wounds treated. However, nothing could have been further from the truth. One of the US soldiers was injected with salt water to see what effects it would have on the body. The other had his chest cut open and a lung removed. The doctors wanted to know how the respiratory system would respond with only one lung. These were only two of many medical experiments that were done on prisoners of war at the time. The most disgusting part is that some of the organs and body parts that were removed may have then been eaten by hungry Japanese soldiers. The war had taken a psychological and physical toll on many. Cannibalism was not an isolated incident, and it did not just happen on one island. In fact, there were accounts of cannibalism across the entire Pacific theater during the time, and each instance was more terrifying than the last. After the war, the atrocities of the Japanese Suzuki unit stationed in the Philippines were uncovered. The Suzuki unit was deployed into the Bukidnon region of the southern Philippines at the beginning of the war. Their mission was to combat any American or Filipino resistance forces in the region. Every day was hot and humid. The Japanese soldiers hiding in the jungles of the Philippine mountains would lose large amounts of water through sweat each day and expend vast amounts of energy just trying to hold their position. It was a brutal environment, and one that likely drove many soldiers crazy. The bugs would constantly be biting, and diseases would make life absolutely miserable. When the Suzuki unit had been deployed, they had only enough rations and resources to last them several weeks. But as the fighting continued and supply routes were cut off, they found themselves foraging for food and stealing from local villages in the mountains. As they continued to fight Allied forces, more and more Japanese soldiers started dying from malaria and dehydration from diarrhea. It was determined by doctors in the unit that the only way the men could stay healthy enough to keep fighting was if they had a constant source of protein. Unfortunately, this was hard to come by in the dense jungles of Bukidnon. The Japanese had killed and eaten local farmers' pigs, livestock, and chickens, and now the only source of protein left were bugs and other humans. The Japanese started to eat the bodies of prisoners who died from illness or injuries. There were also cases of POWs being executed for trying to escape and then immediately being flayed and cooked to feed the Japanese troops. In testimonies by Japanese soldiers, they described in detail how they would sometimes have to sneak into nearby Filipino villages in order to find the victims to cannibalize. In the cover of night, Japanese soldiers would enter a village. If there was someone out alone, they would come up behind them and render them unconscious with the butt of their gun before they could alert others in the village that something was wrong. The soldiers would then bring the victim back to camp, where they would cut meat from their skeleton and eat it to obtain the protein they needed. The human flesh would often be boiled with vegetables. Other times, it would be left out in the sun to be cured. The Suzuki unit's cannibalistic activity was likely done exclusively to stay alive, although surrendering might have been a better option in hindsight. When American forces captured the Suzuki unit and entered their camp, they were horrified at what they found. The human flesh was still in the process of being cooked, and human skeletal remains littered the ground. It became clear very quickly that the Japanese soldiers had been surviving off of human meat for some time. When the remains were examined, it appeared that many of the humans who had been consumed were Filipinos. Nine members of the Japanese unit were sentenced to death for their actions. However, many more likely ate human flesh at the time to keep from starving to death. Surrender was not an option for the Japanese, as they would rather fight to the death than surrender to the Americans and dishonor their country. This was true even if it meant hiding in the jungle and living off human flesh for years. Before World War II officially broke out in the Pacific, Japanese forces had been securing as many strategic points as possible. One of these places was Papua New Guinea, 
Japanese troops were sent to the region relatively early on in the conflict to establish airfields and naval ports to make attacking Australia possible. The Japanese captured soldiers from India, Singapore, and other parts of Asia who were aiding the Allied forces, many of which were then forced to build the wartime infrastructure Japan needed in Papua New Guinea. As Allied forces started gaining ground in the region, Japanese forces retreated further and further into dense jungles. They would take their prisoners with them to aid in building new encampments. Again, surrender was not an option for these Japanese soldiers, so they continued to fight even though the territory was all but lost. They eventually became cut off from supply lines, and no reinforcements would be able to reach them. As food ran out, the Japanese soldiers looked for other sources of protein. They originally tried hunting the aboriginal people of Papua New Guinea, but quickly found out that they were too hard to capture since they knew the land better than anyone. They also tried killing Australian soldiers as a source of sustenance, but this proved to be too difficult as well, so they turned to the prisoners under their control. The Japanese needed them for manual labor, but the intense hunger pains began to overpower any rational thoughts. One Pakistani corporal who survived being a prisoner in Papua New Guinea recounted that toward the end of the war, Japanese soldiers were killing and eating one prisoner a day. The horrifying thing was that this lasted for around 100 days. It's highly likely that over 100 people were eaten by the Japanese soldiers in Papua New Guinea alone, but it gets worse. The other prisoners would watch each night as one of them was selected to be sacrificed so their Japanese captors could satisfy their hunger. The survivor said that whoever was chosen would be taken to a small hut where their screams could be heard echoing through the jungle. It appeared that they would be flayed alive. Those who survived having parts of their legs and arms cut off would then be thrown into a ditch where they would bleed out as they prayed for death. When the Japanese soldiers were questioned about their decision, some startling information came forth. The cannibalism was most often done for survival reasons, but not always. During one soldier's trial, he said that when he had killed and eaten an Australian soldier, it was for two reasons. The first was because he was starving, but the second and more sinister reason was that he had an intense hatred for the enemy. As horrendous and vile as these accounts are, it's important to remember that not every Japanese soldier was engaged in cannibalism. These were isolated incidents. On top of that, most would never have eaten another human if they were not dying from starvation. Early on in the war, intense bombings and fighting occurred within Australia and the surrounding region. The Japanese first attacked the mainland of Australia in February of 1942, when they bombed Darwin and Broome. By the next year, the Japanese had conducted 97 different air raids on the country. During this time, Japanese midget submarines were also entering Sydney Harbour and shelling the suburbs surrounding the city. The Australian military would capture the midget subs every once in a while, but whenever they opened the hatch, the two Japanese soldiers inside would be dead from self-inflicted gunshot wounds to keep them from being captured. It was when the Australians started pushing the Japanese back toward Asia that they uncovered the cannibalism of their own people. Australian troops would advance from one island to the next, making sure they were clear of any enemy presence. When they came to the larger islands of Papua New Guinea and Indonesia, they were met by heavier resistance. It was also here that they would come across abandoned Japanese encampments with human remains scattered around. Oftentimes, the bones showed signs of being butchered. Toward the end of the war, the Japanese soldiers that were left to fend for themselves became desperate. It's in the camps of these soldiers that more signs of cannibalism were found. As Australian soldiers and other Allied forces worked their way through the Pacific Islands and came across Japanese camps, they noted that several contained the remains of captured Australian soldiers. However, the only thing left of them were their hands and feet. Everything else had been eaten. So it would appear that cannibalism was happening all throughout the Pacific Theater by groups of Japanese soldiers. It wasn't done by everyone, but some soldiers who were desperate to survive turned to cannibalism as a means to an end. As crazy as it sounds, eating another human was a better option than surrendering to some Japanese soldiers. That being said, the Japanese were not the only ones who engaged in cannibalism during World War II. When it comes to survival or death, people will do almost anything to stay alive. At the Siege of Leningrad, starving people were seen eating the remains of the dead. It was cold, nothing would grow, and no supplies could enter the city. The only way to survive at that point was to eat anything that contained nutrients, including humans. There were even accounts of people cutting off their own flesh and consuming it, as hunger overcame rational thought. Another example happened after the Battle of Stalingrad, where around 100,000 German soldiers were captured. They were sent to Siberia and Central Asia, where they were held in POW camps. The Soviets had very little sympathy for the Germans and didn't provide them with enough food or water. This led to the Germans resorting to cannibalism of their fallen comrades in order to make it through the brutal winters while locked up in the Soviet camps. To paint a picture of how dire the situation was for the Germans, out of the 100,000 that were captured, only around 5,000 survived until the end of the war. 
In the independent state of Croatia, which was set up and ruled as a Nazi puppet state, a number of concentration and death camps were established to carry out Hitler's final solution. It was here that the fascist Ustasha organization committed genocide against the Serbs and countless Jews to advance the Nazi agenda. It was recorded that when the Ustashas would slash the throats of their victims, they would hold a cup up to their neck to collect blood as it flowed out of the wound. The members of the Ustashas would then drink the blood in a ritualistic fashion. This brings us back to the point that not all cannibalism during World War II was for survival purposes. There are some that believe there might have been a cannibalistic cult-like understanding between certain officers and the Japanese military. There are several accounts given by different Japanese soldiers that said they were forced to consume human flesh and liver by their superior officers. In these situations, the men were not starving, and if they refused to eat the flesh of their enemy, they would have been chastised by their superiors. In extreme circumstances, soldiers were even physically forced to eat the human meat. It was said that officers who made their soldiers eat human flesh connected it back to the Sino-Japanese War that had taken place years earlier. Many of the imperial troops would regularly consume the flesh of their enemies to make them invincible in battle. Some of the higher-ups who were forcing their men to eat human meat in World War II had fought in the Second Sino-Japanese War, which had begun in 1937. And if you don't believe the Japanese and Allied soldiers' accounts of the events, there is a very blatant line of evidence that makes it clear cannibalism was a problem during World War II in the Pacific. A secret Imperial Army order was given on November 18, 1944 that directly addressed the problem of Japanese troops engaging in cannibalism. You might think it would directly condemn them, but that's not quite the case. In the address, the Imperial Government of Japan informed the troops that cannibalism was punishable by death. The caveat here was that cannibalizing an enemy was completely fine. The government was not promoting cannibalism as the order mentioned eating humans as being the worst human crime and that it was due to a lack of thoroughness and moral training. However, as long as it was the enemy being eaten, it was not punished as a crime. At the end of the war, many Japanese soldiers and officers who were found to have engaged in cannibalism were tried for war crimes and sentenced to death. The Japanese government does not allow this part of Japanese history to be taught or discussed in public as it's deemed too sensitive. Scholars who wish to publish information about the atrocities that happened during World War II have to leave Japan to do so. This is why several Japanese historians have sought jobs in Australia and at other universities around the world so they can accurately write about this time in history. It also cannot be overstated that cannibalism by Japanese troops was not the norm. There might have been a cult among certain military leaders that incorporated the ritualistic eating of the liver, but that has not been proven. Most soldiers who did engage in cannibalism did so to stay alive, just like many people have done throughout history in dire situations. The Japanese people were never a society of cannibals, and the atrocities that happened in World War II were never part of the Japanese culture. Now watch Insane Story of Cannibal Clan That Terrorized Europe, or check out Cannibal Island, The Real Battle Royale.